Welcome to Digital Asset News, take a top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some good articles. First up, Bitcoin could shatter 864,000 per Bitcoin by 2024, according to the analyst Plan B. And I thought this was an interesting article. It's just a, a gives us a chance to sit back and dream a little bit because the market right now and over the past week has just been awful. So let's just imagine what could be. Also, Ethereum Classic Labs Executive Director Liz Kuka was on the Alex Maschioli Show and she was asked some pretty tough questions about the third 51% attacks and we're going to go over exactly what she says. And the, and the question is really asked, which is, would you after hearing her response, invest in the Ethereum Classic. And lastly, Aves Lend drops 15% as crypto market punishes DeFi. So we'll get into all that and what's going on with the market. But first, I want to say thanks to everybody who has been watching the videos. We're able to donate to a worthwhile charity called Dog Is My Copilot. We'd already given $50 for this week and we're able to donate another $25. So if you don't know, Dog Is My Copilot allows dogs and cats to be taken from high kill shelter areas in certain parts of the country and flown to certain areas or other states where there is a low occupancy rate and there is a need for pets, dogs and cats and whatnot. So thanks so much for watching the videos and we will continue to donate to this worthwhile cause. Let's break into today's markets. So what a week we've had, right? It is September 6th. It is about, uh, about 12 p.m. high noon Texas time. And it looks like the market is doing a little bit of a recovery, which is fantastic news because I got to tell you, I thought that it would actually drop down to like the 9,500 area, 9,700 for Bitcoin, but we did a little bit of bounce and we're at 1.2%. So looking at Bitcoin as 10.2. Also Ethereum back up to 350. So we are just $50 away from that magical $400 number, which I think they could, uh, Ethereum could definitely get to just takes a little more time. Tether's Tether and XRP is actually doing awful, just like everything else. So XRP is at about uh, 24 cents, really. Chainlink down 27% for the week, but it's up 12% in one day. So that's quite a rebound uh, back up to $12. So not too shabby. Polkadot uh, down 23% for the week, but also up 12% at $4.69. Can't beat that. Bitcoin Cash, which was uh, for a, a very short amount of time in the fifth position. And that's uh, pretty good. Down 50% for the week, but uh, 1.4. Binance Coin making some big, huge strides. 21% in that number eight spot. Litecoin, Bitcoin SV. Bitcoin SV, I don't know why it's still in the top 10. Uh, someone please explain it to me. I don't understand. So in the comment section, please tell me why Bitcoin SV is in the top 10. I just don't get it. Anyhow, Cardano's down. Everything's down. Tron up a little bit. OKB, fantastic. Cosmos. Let's see, what's the big one? UMA, which is another type of DeFi, synthetic and type of uh, coins and whatnot, it's up still 35% for the week, 22% for the day. So uh, if you're looking at uh, one of those little unicorns that actually did great numbers, this is the one. Ido up 10%, 17% for year in finance, Ave up 6.4. Unfortunately, Ave and <clears throat> even year in finance, uh, they're still down a little bit. Although year down for 11%. But uh, I remember when you're in finance, the token itself was around 35, 36,000. Now it's at 23,000 per coin. So quite a bit of a drop. And uh, Abe taken one of the hardest hits. And we're going to talk about that in a bit at 30% on a seven day slide. Man, that's huge. And then uh, Ethereum Classic, which just had their third 51% attack, up 2.5% today. So whatever. I don't get it. All right. Let's go on to today's top story. <sighs> All right, this was a bad week. Let's just let's just call a spade a spade, right? It was pretty junky. So uh, what I like to do is just to kind of recalibrate. Let's just uh, get out there and just start to imagine what could be. I mean, we all got into this space for a specific reason, right? Um, whether that was for the technology or to make a profit or whatever else, this is a great article which allows us just to sit back and dream about what could be. And I do like these ones, especially on a really crappy week. So this was an article I uh, talked about uh, analyst plan B and his stock to flow ratio model. And he talks about how Bitcoin could hit 864,000. Now, do I think that Bitcoin will hit 864,000? Who knows? 
And I could also go to zero, which is like the most commonplace thing that everybody says. Well, go to zero or go to a million, which in my opinion is stupid. I always just say that because it's just the, the thing to say. But in all honesty, it's not going to zero. That's dumb. Bitcoin's not going to go to zero. Okay, it's, it's just not going to happen. It's already, as Mike Novogratz has, has said, it's already crossed the Rubicon. It's already been here to, uh, plus a decade. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants to get into it. Not everybody. A lot of, a lot of the smart money does at least. So I don't think it's going to go to zero. Will it go to eight hundred sixty-four thousand? I don't think that's that's right either, but um, I see somewhere in the hundred to two hundred thousand range. That's just how I see it. Now, do I know when it's going to happen? Obviously not. But uh, when you take a look at this article about what could be, I think there's some conservative numbers uh, that we can all take solace in. So let's just break right into it. Plan B says Bitcoin could eclipse the prediction of his controversial stock-to-flow model ratio, which rise to 864,000 in four years. So I think it's going to be like 20 years. That's what some people say. Like in 20 years, it'll be a million dollars. I'm like, well, I don't care about, I mean, I'm here for the long haul, honestly, but it takes 20 years to get a million. I'm probably going to sell some, but uh, sure. So where does he get these numbers? Well, first he talks about, he made a conservative bet that Bitcoin will hit 288,000. Now, I think within a year to two, it's going to hit 100. And then I think in like four, it could hit 200,000. So 280,000, I can definitely see that. That makes total sense. So he states, I'm on a 280,000 as an average value. 100K would be nice, but if you just follow the math or the data, I don't mean the time series model, what we're looking at, Bitcoin only, we're looking at gold, silver, diamonds, real estate, all that stuff. It's 280,000. That's just an average value. But then this is the unknown. He says it could overshoot like three times, like it did in the last phases. I don't want to mention the number. I try to be conservative, but let's just say 2x or 3x from 288. And then it crashes again, of course. So what he's saying is, so you could go 288 times three. So you're looking at that nice lofty number of 864,000. And again, I don't think it's going to hit that. But I mean, what if it could? I did a video a bit ago and it talked about it was a message from 2012 and it featured Roger Veer and he talked about how uh, Bitcoin was going to you know shoot up to like a thousand dollars and everybody's like that's crazy that's stupid what's it? and then of course now we look at a thousand like can you imagine if Bitcoin dropped to a thousand that's crazy everything's crazy until it actually happens right it's like trying to break that 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 mile barrier when Roger Bannister did it and he broke it for the for the four minute time mark nobody thought it could be done until it got done and now here we are so I see it as coming to fruition in couple of years to pass, right? 100,000, 150,000. And when we look back at these days at 10,000, uh, just like when we looked at that video back in 20, uh, the one from 2012, I was just blown away. I'm like, wow, they were just, that was the vision out there. And th these are people like who has way more vision than me because I would never have thought about this. Like, I mean, I remember my son came back, came home in 2012 and he said, Hey, someone just uh, is going to offer me 500 bitcoins for $500 on a hard drive. And I was like, well, What's a bitcoin? And he told me, I go, That is stupid. No one's going to do that. That's nerd money. Get out of here, kid. And, uh, you know, now here we are and I have my own channel talking about cryptocurrency digital assets. So again, it's about vision. So these things, like, they seem far off. And people, I mean, in the comment section is the comment section and there, people will probably say it, but just kind of sit back and think to yourself, well, what if, what if that could actually happen? Because it could, I mean, it really could. I mean, look at what's happened in the past. So it's a good thing to think about as to why we got into this space. Uh, remember, a thousand dollar Bitcoin not too long ago was hearsay or heresy. Five thousand dollar Bitcoin was incomprehensible. Ten thousand Bitcoin. I remember when ten thousand hit. Uh, in 2017, and they were talking about the Winklevoss now being billionaires, and people were like, that'll never last. That's that's crazy. And now here we are going, oh my God, it flipped over 10,000. So who knows what could happen? I just take, I like to take a look at these and see what if. So let me just think about that in the comment section. Let's move on. Next up, breaking into some more serious business. So this is uh, Alex Maschioli's channel. It's one of my five that I actually recommend and I watch all the time. Alex is great because he's got uh, you know people who are like smart money uh, leaders in the industry. So I like to see what is going on. Surprisingly, he has such low subscribers. I don't understand it. It's the same thing with like uh, Unchained with uh, Laura. She's got very few subscribers. I mean, but she has a podcast and it's awesome. But on YouTube, not that many. But she has like the best guests of all time. So um, if you want to check this out, I definitely I highly recommend him. And you can find all my recommendations in the description. I'm not one of those people that just tries to like hoard all, all the views and all the subscribers. There's way too much information out there. So don't just take, you know, my word for it. There's a lot of different opinions and you shouldn't be in an echo chamber. So get out there 
there and find a bunch of people. So he's just one one of the guys that I listen to. So uh, this is Alex. Uh, then he's got his co-host, uh, Ryan, uh, the much smarter and probably the best haircut in cryptocurrency, I must admit. And then on this one, he's got uh, Liz Kuka. I hope I said her right name right. And she is the executive director uh, for Ethereum Classic Lab. So he had her on and it was... It was a good lesson, uh, you know, like to, to not like badger somebody. Very nice. Uh, but then he got to this question, uh, which was 1736 in, which he, which was the question I think everybody was at was was probably trying to answer, which is what the heck's going on with this 51 percent attack? And listen to what she says. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we'd be remiss not to ask is um, is about what's happened recently over the last couple of weeks. Um, there's been some 51 percent attacks on the ETC. Um, and, you know, I, and you, you look at it and it, you see there might be different motivations for it. Um, there hasn't been any instance, I think 5 million, was, was, nothing that's super out of the ordinary. Like no one walked away with $300 million. Um, can you give us a little hint into that? Because to have a 51% uh, attack on, on a well-known coin uh, such as yourselves, it, it, you know, it brings it to the forefront a little. It does. And in order to do that 51% attack from uh, earlier in the month, the one that kind of netted out 5 million or so, the attacker, so they had to purchase some hash power, right? They spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on that, but they did a double spend. So they also put up $5 million of their own money onto the exchanges where they did the double spend. So we know it's someone who had capital. <laughs> it wasn't just some, like you have to have the capital to really pull it off as well when it comes to double spend. So that, that's certainly unfortunate. Um, one other challenge that happens when you have attacks like this uh, is you can't control an exchange. Like I can't tell any of the great exchanges that we work with, like what to do or what their policy, policies should look like. And so these attacks always happen to hot wallets instead of the cold wallet. So the cold wallet's safe and secure, it's the custody, the custody solution. Well, the hot wallet's what gets targeted and tampered with. Um, and so some exchanges allow for much larger holdings in the hot wallet. And that's how the 5 million was, was stolen essentially, is because an exchange had a, had a hot wallet that allowed for a much greater holding. Uh, secondly, most exchanges or most kind of premier um, well-known exchanges, when you do a large transaction, say like 100 Bitcoin, you're going to have to do a video call to prove you are whom you say you are, have it on record, so on and so forth. And um, that's also something that we've we've seen some exchanges that get hacked or get attacked don't have in place. And so a lot of these hackers or like theft, these thefts um, are happening also at, at an exchange because they know the exchange's vulnerabilities in place. So yes, it's through ETC, but it's also through the exchange. Um, thankfully, no consumers or retail investors were impacted. It's just the exchanges um, who had a loss and had to utilize their insurance, unfortunately, to, <laughs> to deal with it. And if you take a look at Ryan's face right now, he is blown away by that explanation. So I'm not going to say much about this. I'm just going to put it all out there and see what you think. Now, I'm going to link this video in the description, and I highly encourage you to watch the whole thing. It's pretty interesting about what goes on in the background and the stories that are told. Uh, however, I, I will just say this for anybody who is taking a look from the outside in. When I look at people who were involved in very high level positions for a business, um, there are two types that, that I've seen. And Liz kind of does this here. She kind of takes ownership of it, but then she kind of slides off and says, well, this, you know, also the exchanges. Great. I'll always remember Elon Musk uh, during one of um, his launches for SpaceX. And he came out and, and the, the reporters, uh, it actually had was just about to go off. And, and they, they asked him, they said, Elon, what do you think about what, what's going to happen here? He said, well, there's two things. He goes, uh, if, this, if this is successful today, which he goes, I think it is. He goes, I have nothing but praise and high regard to my team around me because they are responsible for this. Uh, they did a great job. However, he says, the second thing is, is if it doesn't work and there's a collapse, and there's something wrong with the launch, then it's all on me because 
it is eventually all comes down to the one person in charge and that is me and uh, I will go back to the drawing board and fix it. So it's always an example and it's the same thing like as far as business, as far as life, even when I was in the military, it's the same type of thing. Take ownership of it, say what it is, say how you're going to fix it and off you go. So again, Liz kind of did it there a little bit, but a little bit of a shirking of responsibility in my opinion, and that's just my opinion. So let me know what you think in the comments section. I did ask that question in a poll, and here's what we got. I said, this is just three hours ago, I said, after watching the video with Classic Labs director Liz Kuka and her explanation, uh, would you invest in Ethereum Classic? And I gave the actual time uh, stamp at 1740. And uh, out of the almost 500 votes, uh, the vast majority is nope. I would not invest into it. And I got to tell you right now, me, I'm the same way. And I understand the explanation that was given, but it's all about confidence. It's all about trust. Trust is a currency that you cannot buy. So when you have these types of issues, you got to come out strong. You got to come out and be like, you know what? This is what happened. This is what we're going to do. This is the, the opportunity that we have. We'll not mess this up and da, 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 da. I mean, I can even remember back, back in the day, and this is, this is for like, this is an old story. Old story for, for older people. So this is back in the early 80s when Johnson & Johnson, who makes Tylenol, uh, somebody had gone into stores and they had taken bottles of Tylenol and they had laced it with cyanide, some some nutcase, and uh, people died. Uh, seven, there was like eight deaths, ten, I can't remember how many deaths there were. So this, as a company, you know, as soon as this happened, Tylenol's shares and the uh, actual stock or product went through the, just, fell through the, through, the, through the ground. No one wanted to buy Tylenol because it could be potentially laced with cyanide. And this is one of those things that was like a big deal. So what did they do? So the CEO of Tylenol came out and he said, look, this is an issue and this is a huge problem. We understand it's all about trust. And here's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to make tamper-proof resistant bottles. We're going to put a cover on top of that. Inside those bottles, each and every one will be a big piece of cotton like we are now all used to. So if you see any of these, these tampered type of products, do not buy it. And we will look into this, this, uh, this issue that has come about and we will make sure that we correct it and it all falls on us. And guess what happened? Tylenol is still around. Within, I think, six months it was, they had regained their entire market share of everything they had just lost. And this is after people had died. So, I mean, that's a very extreme case, but you get where I'm going with this one. Um, me personally, I'm not going to buy Ethereum Classic. I mean, I never really got into it at all anyhow. But uh, there was one thing that, uh, that she did say, which is pretty interesting. Liz did say, you know what? With all these different uh, fees as far as Ethereum goes, Ethereum Classic's looking pretty good. And uh, on that one, you know, she was right because the uh, Ethereum fees right now are through the roof, even with what's going on with DeFi. So let me just think about that in the comments section. That'll be an interesting converse uh, conversation between everybody. And uh, let's move on to our last story. Last up, Aves Lend drops 15% as crypto market punishes DeFi. So the crypto crash, and this is all about decentralized finance. And we did a video yesterday where we talked about how the anonymous founder of SushiSwap essentially had sold all of his shares. So uh, it was down like 72% uh, for the day. But just as a curiosity, let me just take a look at what Sushi's doing right now because I'm sure that the cryptocurrency market is very rational in how they handle things. And nope, 111% up over a day, 141% for the week. So whatever. But uh, hey, if you're out there doing yield farming and uh, DeFi, Hey, have at it. Let me know how that works out. Anyhow, so on top of that, Ave is down. Uh, I think it was down, like we just had to take a look about uh, like 30% for the week. So we'll just say this, Lend is down. So the crypto crash has affected some coins worse than others. Lend, Ave's governance token, has shed 25% in the past 24 hours. Lend collapses 15% amid crypto crisis. You know what? This makes me, what was it? Ave, here we go. So, okay, so it's down 30% for the week, but it's up 13% for the day. So yeah, still around 15%, which is quite a bit, I'll be honest with you. All right, so this strong correction takes the coin's market cap back under a billion after it became the first DeFi cone, coin to achieve cone, to achieve that milestone. So let's see, what is the market cap today? So market cap is, yeah, it's well below that, 687 million. 24 hour volume is 228 million. So yeah, it did take a quite a beating. But it states here, Lend is poised to drop even further as it moves below crucial support lines. Although I don't think that's that's too true because I mean, look at what happened to Sushi there. So I mean, does 
Really, is any kind of like trend lines mean anything in DeFi? Nothing means anything in DeFi. Up is down and down is up. Who cares? Yeah, I got to tell you, DeFi is one of those mysteries. It's like an ICO back in 2017. You know it was a crap product, but you just couldn't help yourself because there's just too much FOMO. And I think that might be what's going on here. I don't know, but I'm not going to invest it into it until I figure it all out. Anyhow, moving down. Lend may continue its descent in the short term as crypto investors rush for the exit and centralized capital in Bitcoin. Yet, many investors remain long on the DeFi coin from a fundamental standpoint, citing Ave's strong product market fit. Before I go on, let me just say this. I'm not against DeFi. I think it has a fantastic place, especially for small business lending. Um, but right now, I just think that they're going through a lot of growing pains. I don't think this is the right iteration of what to invest into for me. Maybe for you, that's fine. But um, I just don't see it for myself. And I think moving on, moving farther down the road, I think it'll be huge. I think it's a necessary thing, especially with what is going on with the banks and how they have screwed us over for so long and the interest rates, which are just out of control, ridiculous. On top of the fact that the savings account, as far as like any kind of savings that you put in, into the, the bank itself, they pay you nothing to stick your money in there. And then they go ahead and lend all your money out. And then of course, what happens in 2008? They crash. So I think the DeFi definitely has its place and I'm a big supporter of it. Just some of these projects, I can't get behind them. I just can't. Anyhow, to finish up, DTC Capital's Spencer Noon noted that what sets apart, what sets Ave apart from other protocols is that it currently does not have liquidity mining processes that attract capital unnaturally. And he states, one of the best signals of PMF and DeFi is if a project can succeed without extra incentives like liquidity mining. So if you don't know, like if you invest into like, or you stake or you borrow any type of uh, specific cryptocurrency on SushiSwap, then you'll get the native token Sushi. And of course they give it to you for free, which is weird because like, I mean, you're borrowing money, but they're like, hey, also take the Sushi, which is worth, now it's like, I don't know, three bucks. And they, and they give you so many of those. And then, so you're like making money on borrowing money. Ah, it's just weird. But on, in this case, what he's saying is that Abe doesn't do that. So Abe doesn't have liquidity mining yet. It's still one of the biggest beneficiaries of new yield farming activity at 1.6, 1.26 Total volume locked and only 759 million market cap. The fundamentals are strong. Could be. And lastly, multi-capital partner Kylie Samani made a very similar comment knowing that Lend would be the only DeFi coin he would invest in for the next two years if it came to it. He said, if I had to hold a single Ethereum-based DeFi asset for two years, it would be Aave. By far the best combination of product and market fit, token distribution, community, pace of innovation, and reasonable valuation with upsides to go. Even Arthur Hayes, guy from BitMEX, said pretty much the same thing. So I'm not too well versed in Ave. I need to do my own research. I need to do my due diligence. I'm going to take a look at it just because of this article. It sounds interesting. Maybe down the road, this could be huge. But I will say this, because of the DeFi problems that are going on, I mean, you see like the Ethereum liquidations. This is from Alex Mashinsky. He's the CEO of Celsius. And he goes, and of course, they do uh, interest rates or, you know, uh, you can gain interest just by staking your cryptocurrency on their app. And they also do loans. And it's one of my one-two punches. And if you're looking for, like an alternative to Coinbase or any type of exchange, take a look at my wallet exchanges information Google spreadsheet. It's uh, in the description of every one of my videos. It's got a link looks just like this and you can sign up for any of them. But uh, what he's saying here is ETH is dropping fast, partially due to short sellers and DeFi liquidations, which it did drop way below 400. Now it's like 350, so not bad. If this continues, he states, your ETH loans with Celsius, Celsius Network can be affected. Your options are add any collateral, we accept 32 coins, return some of the borrowed funds, sell some of your coins. I think this is admirable because he's not like, hey, we're going to liquidate all you guys. So sorry, suckers. He's just saying, look, if it keeps dropping, which, you know, hopefully it goes up and everything's good. He goes, we need you to do these three things. But they don't want to liquidate everybody. They want their consumers to have a good experience. And that's what all businesses should do. They shouldn't just liquidate you right off the bat and just like, well, sorry, next time. Good luck, buddy. Um, this is the exact opposite. So uh, that's one of the reasons why also Celsius is my one-two punch. I like these guys and I believe in that guy. So with all those things we just talked about and all the things that have happened in the market and what's going on and the sky is falling, how do we position ourselves for the next evolution to be successful? Well, let's jump into the office and let's go over a cue of the day. All right, everybody, welcome back to the office. So today it is Sunday. It's a nice early day. I got up early, got to jump on things, which is uh, the best way to do it. But 
uh, for the cue of the day, um, it's not really a cue uh, per se, but it's it comes from us um, in the comments section from yesterday's video where we talked about the founder, the, sh the master chef, I guess they call him, who uh, created Sushi Swap, did what would be considered an exit scam. And uh, that was a video that we talked about yesterday. Go check that out. Uh, it's a little disturbing, uh, but uh, hey, what are you going to do? You know, this is, this is the, the, the sandbox that we are in. And uh, uh, just, take, just watch the video. That's all I'll say. But the comment that comes to us today, uh, it was from Corey Bray. And it was a pretty good comment. He says, so he says, the market is taping, taking a dive, you say. Oh, you mean all my favorite cryptos are being discounted so I can grab tons of them for cheaper? Uh, you would have to be a complete idiot not to take advantage of this grand opportunity. Bullish is all the way to the moon, baby. Which I have to uh, admit, I am an idiot a lot of times. Let's let's uh, just be honest. Uh, ask my wife, she'll tell you. But uh, one of these things about is like, you know, should I buy or should I not buy? And all I can say is I'm just going to tell you exactly what I did yesterday. And what I did yesterday was... I, we all know that on this channel, I always preach about dollar cost averaging, Me meaning don't, you know, take your $5,000 that you have from whatever, how, wherever you got it from, right? Let's say you were saving it up and you just go in there and go, you know what? I think uh, polka dot would be a great one. Let me just put 5,000 bucks into polka dot today and I'm sure it'll work itself out. Well, if you had done that last week, polka dot was somewhere around 620, 640, somewhere around there. And then a couple of days ago, it was like around four bucks. So or actually, yesterday was on four dollars. So the thing I'm always talking about is dollar cost averaging. Now, yes, what I usually do is I, I they're all automatic. They, I I set them up on either uh, Voyager or Gemini because they have an automated dollar cost averaging tool. I can put twenty five bucks into Cardano. I can put a hundred bucks into Ethereum, and I can set it up as either uh, once a day, every three days, every week, every two weeks, every month, or whatever I want to do. So I don't have to pull the trigger every time, which is good for me because I got the stuff to do, right? Uh, if you're looking for an alternative to Coinbase, uh, check out my spreadsheet, which talks about all the different things that I use as far as wallets and exchanges, where I talk about Celsius and Voyager being my one-two punch. And you can get the you use the links in there. You don't have to use my links. You can go right to, to Voyager or Kraken or wherever else. But if you use the links, you get like between 10 and 25 bucks just for signing up if you need that. So that is that, that is one side about dollar cost averaging. But yesterday, when I took a step back and I looked at what was going on, see, I learned this from my mistake in March. Remember when March happened and everything just went you know down? I bought very little things because I was like, first of all, it was one of those really scary times, honestly. But you look at it, you're like, is this going to go back up? Is this going to go back up in like a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of years? Is this, you know, even me who, who I'm actually in this space, I tend to start to doubt until I have to like just sit back and go, okay, this is why the technology is here. This is what's going to happen. I remember the history. I have to actually go through it each and every time. So yesterday was a little bit easier because I'm like, you know what? I said to myself, Rob, you screwed up last time in March. You know you should have bought more and you didn't. And this is the time to buy. So what did I do? I bought not a massive amount, but I bought more Bitcoin. I bought more Ethereum. I bought more Cardano. I bought more Chainlink. I bought more Polkadot. And I went outside of my regular dollar cost average because the prices were here. And then all of a sudden they came down to here. So what I am thinking is that there's only so low it can go, right? I mean, we don't know where it, what, what could happen. Tomorrow it can go straight up or in another 24 hours it can go all the way down to the floor because I believe that there is a bubble and it is called DeFi and it is bursting and we see a lot of different problems and that's what's happening with Ethereum and all the different things like Sushi, like Yearn, uh, Aave or Ave, however you want to say it. So will we go back up? I don't know, but I know yesterday was a great deal and... I had to take it and I had to take it and I learned from what I didn't do in March to what I should have done back then to what I did yesterday. So that's where we're at. And uh, I'm not telling you to do these things. I'm just telling you this is what uh, I felt uh, I should do and this is what worked out for me. And also, um, if you think about it, if you had bought at a higher price uh, beforehand, you felt kind of stuck, you're like, shoot, I kind of FOMO'd in on that one. I should have done it. Um, what you can do is you can buy it at a lower price and now your average cost is in the middle. So like, let's say you bought 
polka dot and you dumped in you know a bunch of money at six bucks well yesterday it was around 450 if you would have bought a 450 450 to six is like somewhere like 525 so that's your average cost that you did and then you can sell it if you want to uh, you don't have to wait till it hits six seven eight nine nine dollars you can actually go at 525 and sell it and you, you won't feel that pressure the big thing is not feeling the pressure so you can actually get things done and uh, move forward so uh, that is my thing today I'm not telling you what to do not financial advice but i'm just telling you what i did uh, from the lessons i learned from march all right so that is it and i would say make mention of this in the bottom right hand corner there's a join now button um you don't get anything special if you join up for uh, digital asset news but uh what i do is i do give random shout outs so uh, just to sign up, it's a buck ninety nine. It's like a tip, but I just do random shout outs. So hype me up, Lee Stone Brackets, Regina Halasinski. I nailed it. I nailed that name. Jesse Kirkland. Who else we got? David Worm, Big Worm, Crypto Swords, and Amuse Web Design. All right. So for everybody who signed up, I really appreciate it. Also, I want to give another special thanks. I almost forgot. Uh, we hit seventy five thousand subscribers. I don't know how we did that, but uh, I'm pretty happy that it happened. So thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, that's it. If you'd like uh, these types of videos, there's going to be two more that's going to pop up on your left and right. Uh, so check those out. And uh, that's it for today. So thanks. See you on the next one.